Good afternoon and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Tuesday, March 9th, and uh, today we are going to be starting with H uh, 133, an act relating to emergency relief from abuse orders and relinquishment of firearms. And um, we should have, it's uh, draft 2.1 that we're going to uh, be looking at. And since it's, it's been a while, um, I've asked Eric just to go over the, um, the draft again. And uh, there's one that's highlighted and then there's a clean copy. And the um, highlights reflect what I, what I call the uh, Leffler Amendment, <laughs> which I'm not, I'm not sure you want it to be your amendment, but, um, but certainly helpful language um, when we spoke about this bill before. So. Eric, thank you. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel here to uh, talk with the committee about S H-133, sorry. Uh, Representative Grad, you were mentioning there are two drafts, one with some highlights and one without. Do you want to look, look, take a look at the highlighted one first or do you have a, a preference? Um, I think the highlighted would be great. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, let me pull that one up and that way everyone can um, take a look at it as we're, as we're moving through it. Um, Evan, could you make me a co-host please? Perfect, thank you. See if I remember how to do this since it's been a week or so. All right, let's see, let's make sure we're on the right one here, which I believe we are. Okay, so uh, we do have the right document up as Representative Grad mentioned, this is version 2.1 of the committee strike all amendment. So you've already uh, looked at one amendment to the bill as introduced, and this is a second version of that with a couple of more changes, which we'll get to in a moment. But this is an act relating to emergency relief from abuse orders and relinquishment of firearms. Remember, generally kind of uh, since it's been a while, just to ground the committee in what the substance of the bill is, this has to do with emergency RFAs, emergency relief from abuse orders, which the court can issue uh, when a family member or household member of a person comes into court and is able to show uh, to the court's uh, satisfaction that uh, the person who came into court, the plaintiff, has been abused or the plaintiff's children has been abused, and there's an immediate danger of further abuse. So those two findings are made by the court that the plaintiff or the plaintiff's children have been abused and there's this immediate danger uh, of further abuse, then the court can issue uh, what's known as an RFA, relief from abuse order, which imposes certain restrictions on the defendant's conduct. And the existing law lists several types of restriction that can be imposed on what the, plaintiff, uh, what the defendant can do with respect to the plaintiff. And, you may remember what some of those are, but just to go through them real quick, uh, the court, for example, I'm in subdivision A now, kind of going from page one to page two. They can uh, include in the order that the, that the defendant uh, has to refrain from abusing the plaintiff or the plaintiff's children or uh, any of the pets or animals that they have. Uh, they can refrain, order the, the defendant, uh, refrain from interfering with the defendant's, sorry, with the plaintiff's personal liberty or personal liberty of the children. Uh, refrain from coming within a fixed distance of the plaintiff or the plaintiff's children or the fixed distance of the plaintiff's residence or their place of employment. So that's uh, essentially you know, a, a, a restriction on how close the defendant can come to the plaintiff either personally or where the plaintiff mm -hmm. lives or works. And lastly, a no contact order that they have no contact at all with the plaintiff or the plaintiff's children in any way, you know, whether telephone, email, whatever it may be. Um, and so what H-133 does, proposes to do, is to add uh, another potential item that the court can include in its relief from abuse order. I should mention right then, as, as the committee has heard before, that from what the committee's heard from uh, Judd Gerson and, and others, is that this condition of uh, relinquishing firearms is commonly uh, included in RFAs currently. So the idea behind H-133 is to codify, to put in statute uh, what is the current practice of uh, judges when they are asked to issue these relief from abuse orders currently. 
Sorry about that. I have a phone ringing there just for a moment. Hang on. So, um, as I mentioned, this is a, is a reflection of current practice uh, is essentially being codified here in subdivision E. And that, that uh, language codifies the ability of the court to order as part of the RFA that the defendant, and now we're looking at the language on line 12, immediately relinquish until expiration of the order. So that's a crucial piece of the language that, that the relinquishment provision only lasts as long as the order is in effect. You may remember that these temporary relief from abuse orders have a maximum effective period of 14 days. So it will, within that 14 day period of time, the court has to schedule a hearing on a final relief from abuse order, or it can always just dismiss the petition completely. But if it's gonna go forward, there has to be a hearing. Uh, and then the court will decide whether to issue a final relief from abuse order. But so, for the period that the temporary RFA is in effect, uh, the court can order immediate relinquish relinquishment of any firearms that the defendant that are in the defendant's possession, ownership, uh, or control. Um, so you see, there's a typo. I just noticed. <laughs> Hopefully, it's not going to be in the in the final version. But the words "or control" on line 13 were inadvertently struck. So this should the proposal here, the amendment to the, uh, the previous version of the amendment that you looked at, you remember that it included not only firearms that were in the defendant's possession, ownership or control, uh, and then I'm going on to lines 13 and 14, but it also included firearms that another person possesses or controls on behalf of the defendant. And after some committee discussion on that, it sort of became apparent that that, that language was not only less than clear, but that it also was redundant because uh, the firearm that was in the, uh, control of the defendant, him or herself, uh, would already be included within that language. So the committee decided that there was really no no reason to include it. So the idea was to strike it. But uh, there's two ex two words struck there that should not have been on line 13. The words or control uh, should still be in there. Um, so that's one change. The first change is to strike this whole notion of another person possessing, owning, or controlling the firearm on behalf of the defendant. So then it goes on and says, okay, not, not only is the, is the, can the order include relinquishment, it also can include an order that the defendant refrain, I'm, I'm on the end of line 14, refrain from acquiring or possessing any firearms while the order is in effect. So that means going forward, you know, you relinquish what you have and going forward, uh, you can't acquire or possess any firearms, again, while the order is in effect. So that's going to be a maximum of 14 days, uh, at which time the court will hold the, the final hearing and decide whether whether a final order should issue. So that's the scope of the addition to um, the elements that can be included in the emergency RFI by the court under, under H-133. I might want to take a quick look at the final language here to see if there's a, that same typo needs to be fixed or whether it's in there. The, the um, clean draft does have or control in it. Oh, great. Thank you. Yep. So there you see line 13. So um, that's correct, as you mentioned. So you see the way it would lead, it would, the way it would read cleanly is that the order can, can include a provision that the defendant immediately relinquish until expiration of the order all firearms that are in the defendant's possession, ownership, or control, and to refrain from acquiring or possessing any firearms while the order is in effect. The effective date of the proposal is on passage so that uh, this provision would go into effect as soon as it was passed by the both, both houses and signed by the governor. Great, thank you, Eric. Any, sure. question, any questions for Eric? And uh, I'm may not see people's hands, so uh, feel free to jump in if I don't call on you. Yeah, uh, this is Tom, I have a question. Uh, it, it's really not about the bill, it's, it's about, uh, it's on passage. I, I guess I'd forgot that the governor still signs things that are on passage. Is, it, is that where there's like a three day uh, window that he has to sign it within, is, is that right? 
That's just no. That's a. I mean, that is true, but that's a separate issue. That, that uh, um, this just that language just means that as soon as the the governor signs it, it becomes effective. As opposed to, you know, if there were no, if that language is not there, there's sort of a a fallback uh, principle that anything that's passed by the houses and signed by the governor goes into effect on July first. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, if you said nothing, it would go into a, and the governor signed it, let's say on just to pick a date, May, May 15. Uh, yep. Maybe I'm being optimistic there, <laughs> but let's say that's what it was. Um, the, uh, then it wouldn't go into effect until July 1st. But if you put in shall be effective on passage, that means that as soon as the governor signs it on May 15th, it becomes effective immediately. OK, so the official passage is his signature. Correct. OK, I, I, I probably knew that at one time, but. <laughs> Or maybe yeah, not. Was, no, I'm sure you did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Anybody else? And again, jump in. And I'm not seeing any hands, but I want to make sure that I get everybody's questions. Shall I pull down the document for a moment or so um, you can? Sure. Yeah, that, that's fine. Yeah, I'm not seeing any, any hands, but all right. Well, thank you, Eric. Sure. There we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there you are. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Great. Oh, so Tom, I do see your hand. Is that from before or? No, no. Uh, history would tell you that it is, but <laughs> okay. yeah, just a question um, around uh, on page two, the amendment in the highlighted or not highlighted, I guess, but on line 13, uh, 14 and 15. So does that language still covers firearms that are in the, the possession of, of somebody else? You mean the final language? Yes. Yeah, I think that that if you sort of think about how that uh, situation could play out, let's say, for example, uh, uh, a defendant doesn't want to relinquish firearms. So um, he or she uh, owns their, their firearms to a friend or to a family member. Um, sorry, you're going to hear our dog in the background there. That's all right. <laughs> uh, the, uh, um, but, they're not, but they still remain, they're, they, they're still owned by the defendant. They're just sort of giving them to another person in order to not have to relinquish them, for example. Yeah. Uh, then, yeah, I think the language that you have covers that because they are still in the defendant's control uh, and they are still in the defendant's ownership. They may not be in their physical possession at the moment, but they, if the defendant owns them uh, or in any other way controls them, I think that um, that would that would be covered by the language that you have. And that's why you didn't really need that other language saying right. referring specifically to another person. And, and that's kind of what I thought with the ownership. I mean, that's I mean, ownership is ownership. So it doesn't right. matter where if something is in your house or two cities away, I guess. But okay, thank you. Yeah. Great. Uh, any other questions? I'm not seeing anybody. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Eric. So committee, as you know, this is uh, been up for um, or noticed as a uh, discussion and, and possible vote. And I think we have taken a lot of uh, testimony on this. I really appreciate the testimony of all the witnesses um, in person and, and written. Uh, and so at this point, I would entertain a, a motion um, to pass a uh, draft, just to make sure this is correct, 2.1 of H-133. Oh, Tom, your hand is up again. Uh, okay. So, I'm back to normal. <laughs> okay. So anyway, I would entertain a, uh, a motion in a second and then uh, have discussion. Uh, so moved. Second. Thank you. the well. Okay, great, thank you. Um, any discussion? Okay, not seeing any, uh, Ken, sure. Are we voting on the amendment first or is that already in the new language? 
how are we doing that? Just so I'm clear. So voting on um, 2.1, which incorporates um, the the language that we had um, actually discussed last time we were we were here. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm not not seeing any hands in terms of uh, discussion. So the clerk shall commence to call the roll. Right, you're good, Ken? Yeah, Colburn. Yes. Donnelly. Yes. Goldslant, no. Lalonde. Yes. Leffler. No. Norris. No. Not. Yes. Rachelson. Yes. Christy. Coach. Kevin. Hey, right, well, we're out of names. Yeah, we'll come back to Coach. Okay. Verdict. No. Madam Chair. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So let's um let's hold it open for Coach, and uh, Will. I think you're gonna you're still on for reporting it, right? Yes. Very much Great. so. Great. Great. Well, thank you. And I again, I really appreciate um everybody's engagement and uh, respectful conversation in, in, um, in this important bill. And uh, so as soon as we um, hear from coach, we can add him. Um, okay, great. Well, thank you. All right, so let's see. 87, Hi, my schedule again. You may be ahead of, uh, we are, we are ahead of ourselves in terms of uh, in terms of <coughs> uh, all right. Why don't we take a uh, let's take a break? And because um, we do have witnesses for uh, for eighty seven, and we're we are ahead of ourselves. So um, you want to come back, Maxine? I'm sorry. What? What time would you like to come back? So um, it says 2.15 for the witnesses and uh, yeah, so why don't we come back around 2.10 or so and then Eric will do a walkthrough of, um, of the language which is just pertaining to the fines, right, and then we, and then we have some witnesses.